Alexander Ryan of Henry County and state ever said, hath bargained and sold and do hereby bargain and sell a certain Negro girl by the name of Harriet, aged about 11 years, of very light complexion, with straight hair. I do hereby warrant her to be sound and well, and further warrant and defend the right and title of said girl to the said Brian against myself, my heirs, and assigns mm. forever. I was elected to the position of clerk in 2012. So when I started the position in 2013, you know, just taking a cursory look, doing an inventory of the records that we have, looking in our mezzanine in our vault, I discovered we have records of enslaved people. So it was just an amazing discovery, you know, it opening the book, reading the language, reading a deed that says, I'm selling Harriet, age 11, fair complexion, long straight hair warranted to be sound and well for $250. To me, it's like a selling point. Mm -hmm. For what purpose, I dare not say. It just made the hairs on my arm, you know, arms raise. It was very chilling, very shocking. But also, it was kind of exciting. Why? It was exciting because being from Macon, I never knew we had these records here. Macon is in the heart of Georgia. We are the hub, and this was a central marketplace, if you will, for the trading of enslaved people. People came from all around to Macon to purchase and sell enslaved people. So it had a major impact on the market, on the day-to-day -day life. We see from the records that they were traded like cattle and sometimes with cattle. You know, you could go downtown on any given day and see, you know, an auction, if you will, of humans being sold. Macon was founded in 1823 as a fall line city to profit from both the slave trade and the cotton trade. Macon was founded by the state legislature, and it was one of two cities founded on the fall line of the state. So Columbus over on the western side on the Chattahoochee River, and then Macon on the Okmulgee. And this was the highest point of navigation from the coast. And so if you were founding a city, you wanted to be able to have transportation to get your, your crops and, and people and everything else to a point that you could get down to the coast. American Indians had long recognized the value of locating a trading city on the fall line. The area that we know now is Macon and Bibb County basically has been inhabited for anywhere from 15,000 to 17,000 years. It's like in real estate. It's location, location, location. And the, the particular area that we chose as what we now know as the Macon is actually right on the fall lines. And this was perfect location for all of the uh, cultures that actually have lived here before. The Woodland Indians, they traveled by uh, canoes and until the damming of the Okmulgee River, this was the farthest you could take a boat of any kind up the Okmulgee River because of rapids. The American Indians themselves, they had actually been swindled out of a lot of land. From the first treaty that they signed with uh, James Oglethorpe in 1732, one of those treaties they actually brandished swords. They actually invited the, Mus the Muscogee chiefs there, or Mikos, there to discuss this. And when they got them there, they actually brandished swords and muskets and forced them to put their mark on paperwork. The removal of the Muscogee Creek enabled a new kind of trading city. Macon became instantly a transportation center because of its location on the river. So people who were living further out away from Macon could transport their cotton into town. In fact, that's how the street Cotton Avenue got its name, because it was part of the old federal road system. And wagons would come in on, the, on Cotton Avenue and bring their cotton into town. And then as the railroads were built in the 1830s, then those rail lines connected all of Georgia to parts of Alabama and Tennessee and, and North Carolina and South Carolina and back down to the coast. And so enslaved people could be moved along routes from places like New Orleans or Montgomery 
or Savannah or Charleston, you could then bring enslaved people to markets here who could then be um, offered to a planned plantations that maybe didn't, the owners didn't go all the way to Savannah to, to gain access to that labor pool. My great grandmother was sold into slavery as a 13 year old girl in Virginia and came with the major uh, migration south, which was a great migration when cotton became king and, and enslaved people being shipped from Virginia and North Carolina where tobacco had been king for so long. And of course, that uh, great grandmother was sold to a gentleman by the name of John Ellis as a 13 year old girl and uh, hence the name Ellis. And of course, in those days, you carried the name of your enslaver, whoever you were owned by, and she was owned by this man. By the age of 19, she had already given birth to two sons, and those sons had been sold into, sold off at seven and nine years of age, had been sold off to other plantations. And in 1860, it was listed in the city directory of having slave market at second and popular, third and popular, all up and down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, there were slave markets and other places they're making their slave markets. But in particular, those were listed as uh, places that were in the city directory as you, places you could go to do that business. So it, it's, it's a very heavy history on Poplar Street. There was cotton and the commodity of enslaved black people being traded. One Macon slave trader left a detailed record of his transactions. January 1st, 1859, Saturday. Beautiful clear day, family all well. The old year closed prosperously. People of all classes seem to be in comfortable condition. Money seems to be what people call plenty. Negro girls and boys aged 9 to 12 sell quick at from $900 to $1,100 each, and grown young men and women $1,100 to $1,400. Sunday. Quite cool, but still dry. Yesterday I bought a little Negro boy from a man in Tennessee by the name of Bell. The boy is about nine years, copper color, and named William. But I shall try and change his name and call him David, as I already have one servant named William. I gave in money $717.50 for the boy. To put this in perspective, the value of $1,500 in 1850 would have been $50,000. So, and this is close to 1860, so it's going to increase just a little bit more. But for the, for the boy who was $717, he would have been worth somewhere in the range of $25,000 today. Every part of Macon's economy was built upon slavery. The enslaved people were literally the foundation of this community. The, the city government owned enslaved people to do road work, road repairs. The railroad rented slaves to make these projects happen. Even if you didn't own an enslaved person, if you, if you owned a store, you might be selling food or dry goods or clothing to a slave owner who was, who was clothing his enslaved person or, or a whole family of enslaved people. That money that ran through that business then ran to a bank. A bank would loan money for people to buy plantations or to speculate in cotton. Or, and they collateralized enslaved people as part of the wealth system and so that you could borrow against your enslaved person. Our previous location on 2nd Street um, in our history, it's you know described at the time as being the jewel of downtown Macon. In our research into our history, we found that the financing for that building was made possible in part uh, by uh, most likely the sale of enslaved people from within the membership of the church, which knowing the membership of our congregation, that it was both white and black members, 
um, it's entirely likely that we finance the building of our new sanctuary through the sale of our own members. It's those sorts of stories uh, that are in between the lines of our history and that we've been uncovering and confessing together as a congregation. We, as a society, uh, have talked about slavery as something regrettable that happened in the past that really has no bearing on, on the present. Where were our tithes coming from? But from, certainly in the case of our, our most uh, well-off membership, from slave labor from you know, money generated through slave labor and through slavery, um, it would be impossible to separate our church's financial history, you know, which is today connected to how it was 150 years ago. Uh, you can make th those ties. It would be impossible to, um, uh, to speak of our church's um, resources without acknowledging that it was rooted in an economy based on enslaved labor. That's just a fact. Enslaved people in Macon, when they could, found ways to resist and escape. They found ingenious ways of escaping. One of those was Ellen and William Craft. Ellen herself was actually the daughter of her master. So by her being what we call light skin or you know, light complexion, she actually, they, her and her husband actually came up with a plan to escape by her pretend dressing in men clothing and pretending to be, you know, you know, her master and her husband William, who was a darker complexion, he was her, you know, her valet. And they actually left Macon by way of train. They boarded a train in Macon, uh, went to Savannah. Once they got to Savannah, they got on a steamboat and they eventually found their way up to Boston where there were settlements of free blacks. Uh, so it was an ingenious escape way, uh, but it also was a dangerous one because they never knew what would happen if they had gotten caught on the way. Being enslaved, forced to work for free, not knowing whether they would be torn away from their families at any given moment, a son or daughter sold away from a mother or father, um, a husband and wife, enslaved people being torn apart, Dealing with all of that daily trauma of not knowing, yet they persisted, they persevered, they were resilient, and I stand on their shoulders. If we don't recognize what happened and how all of that labor was lost to the people who provided it, then we don't give dignity to the people that are here today who were their descendants. I feel recognition an acknowledgement that this town was not built by white people um, alone. It was built on the backs of enslaved people. And until we understand that, we lose the richness of the entire creation of this thing we call Macon. There's that great uh, story I've heard attributed to Howard Thurman, uh, you know, wonderful uh, writer back in the, in the 20th century. Um, about as a young boy, um, watching as an, as an older man, uh, was planting a pecan tree, is what I've heard. And he comes up and he says, you know, why are you planting that tree? Um, you know, you'll never get to eat uh, of, of, of the, the, the fruit of this tree. And, and the old man looks at him and says, boy, I've been eating from trees I didn't plant my whole life. And it seemed like a good idea to leave one for the people who come after me. There's a real weakness in the story we tell about ourselves as Americans, as Christians, when we don't acknowledge the ways uh, that we all eat from trees that we didn't plant. That is such a powerful way of entering into these conversations about race, about racial justice, about equality and equity. If we can start there by realizing that the ways that in which we all um, live and breathe uh, through the gifts of others, good or bad. Um, that seems like a really helpful starting place for these conversations. I think that what would be dehumanizing is to seal the books, stuff them away, and not share them. I think that opening the book, shedding light on the records, shedding light on the people in the record, that's what gives these people life.